bright ideas, okay, uh, the issue discussions, okay, I think some of you have learned about it, okay. Uh, what we have done, at least some of you, we made some of your colleagues extremely uh, busy, okay. But, uh, so I think uh, in this round, so we have collected data and understanding you writing a formal report, right? But today I'm not boring with all the formal report issues. Okay, so let's have a little bit of discussion uh, <coughs> that uh, what are the new emerging technologies coming in and how we see the future telecommunication networks are going to look like. Okay. Now, of course, I don't have the crystal ball. Okay. <laughs> I sit uh, just like you, an amazed student of all the things happening, right? So, but a little bit my uh, gray hair, okay. So I'll tell you that what is my kind of the, the major issues and uh, the brightness of the future, okay, my take on it. So, <coughs> we are, uh, as we heard, that we are, <coughs> it most likely the technology transition, a major transition uh, time. So, <coughs> the way, uh, I, as a student of telecommunication revolution, right, which I'm trying to learn, what I see <coughs> that telecommunication <coughs> started with uh, Marconi, right? The Marconi actually first made the, the radio wave communication possible, right? And after that started with telegraph. And then we have seen the era of uh, fixed telephone. And now we are living into the time of mobile phone and internet. So, what's next? In fact, <coughs> there's every indication, even the mobile phone and internet era is most likely coming to an end. They're transitioning into something new. Of course, telegraph didn't go away, right? Telephone, fixed telephone didn't go away. So it's not a complete a chain, but the mainstream will be something new. And how we can see that? <coughs> we all have to see, look at our smartphones. So what our young generation is running in the smartphones. Uh, we view as a telephone, right? But those who are t uh, 10 years or 20 years young, right? They don't see, hardly they use telephone number or anything. It's the same device though, but they are interacting with respect to Facebook, right? To them is Facebook, to them is Twitter, it's a WhatsApp, right? Instagram. So same device, the older generation are seeing as an old, the going away telephone, right? Are they going to use telephone number ever? The young generation who are using uh, WeChat or this, uh, the Facebook? I doubt it. They are going to go uh, grow older, right? 10 years, they'll be 10 years. Those who are 20 years age, they'll be 10 years, 30 years age. They'll be running all the companies, right? Country, everything. And in 20 years, they'll be really senior person and will be gone. Okay. I don't think that it is reasonable to expect that any one of them who are quite comfortable with Facebook and all the new communication modalities, right? Will ever come back to telephone number. Yeah. And this is so immediate. We are talking about 10, 20 years. Yeah. So <coughs> the devices are going to <coughs> evolve with that, right? So all they care, hardly they care about a telephone, all they care maybe a laptop pin from Facebook that carries it so within uh, uh, my uh, jacket, the whole communication, right? The, there is already product. The jackets are in the market. The jackets have wear inside. Sufficiently well, so all you do, there is a small chip here is listening to us. Everything is there, the computer is there, and the other parts of the body, the wear reaches, and you cannot distinguish that part. Well, okay. instead, has uh, 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 a school of fashion design number ranked in the top three, right? Come there and see how this new kind of fashion things, which are extremely high tech, the researchers will be. So now what's happening, we are transitioning into the time of a network society. So the communication, these things were kind of external thing, right? No longer that. But I say we have already 
we got our first artificial organ. What is that? Cells from the cavity, right? It's just as important as a liver, kidney, and some of us can actually let our kidney go, but not the cell phone, right? All it is there. Okay. So this is going to evolve and get, it will disappear maybe from the as a physical device, right? But the embodiment of a big transition we have seen. So now of course, <coughs> as we stand in 20, 16, 17, 18, so we hear these terms, smart citizen, smart community, augmented reality, autonomous car, smart home, cloud. BitTorrent, Bitcoin, right? So these are in bits and pieces. News to us actually, the everything together is as actually ushering a very rapid transition into my society. You, you might see the Bitcoin the way it is taking over. You might see very fast the McDonald's and all the chains. The whole cash register culture is going to go away. Who needs to worry about the cash register money counting every right? Wasted of time. All you do is your app, right? Some sort of app device and it might get bug on That you just say that this is the thing I want. The menu appears somewhere else, right? All you walk into a restaurant or a shop and you already have picked up before going there, right? Everything you want. So this is very close, the going away of the cash register. Okay. So it will change even the shops. Amazon is talking about delivery the product to your home, right? Mm -hmm. But see, we are into new cultures. Okay, the why delivering the product to your home? Because we have two models, either go and pick up from the shop or to the home, right? Mm -hmm. So the previous communication technology, real communication, technical communication required us to have a place, physical place to exchange things. Well, that might not be necessary. But why the drone have to come to your home? Drone knows real time where you are, you might be driving at that time. And drone can find you in between your transit. And just open your the car room and drop the thing there. Or maybe in a small bucket at the top of your car, right? So you don't have to deliver things in your home as well, right? While you're driving into delivery. And is the addressing anything in the technology impossibility? Everything, all the pieces <coughs> are right? If somebody has to walk out the system home. So we are there. So that's what <coughs> is uh, the big issue of future network and provision now network for it. Okay. So now comes the complex picture that how do you fast move our telecom infrastructure? We started from telephone, right? Or telegraph. Okay. And then we own the infrastructure, we don't need to go away in one day, there's a huge investment, billions of dollar investment have been made, right? For centuries. So how we transfer it to uh, adopt to all these new technologies coming. Okay. So I touch into quite a few aspects of uh, what we need to do, how we can do it quick, reviewing uh, this uh, TikTok. So <laughs> where we want to go and to track uh, the, uh, the 5G, all of you have heard about it, right? Being an HCMC, right? An exciting future for telecom industry. Okay. This is coming, this is increase of bandwidth and so on. But I will go into some of the meta issues in this TikTok. So I will talk about something called active networking or software defined networking. Why? How we address the rapid change our, uh, we need to make on our infrastructure. Okay. And I will talk about another big thing how the telecommunication back in uh, design of the global uh, network infrastructure is changing. So we start with the term which is most close to us, software defined network. It may look a little bit academic to you, but I'll try to make it as uh, much as possible uh, the, the, the everybody we can understand. Okay. So what it means is infrastructure, rapidly sharing of infrastructure. Okay. So uh, all of you are uh, the uh, telecommunication experts, right? Telecom engineers, okay, double uh, uh, E, E, Right? These are your background. So all of you know what is network. Uh, so what is network is made up of switches and links. So the links can be optical fiber, copper wire, right? Or radio links and uh, switches. 
So uh, today, <coughs> all those switches comes with some interface. So when packet arrives from this mix, the switches have these layers of software which will decide which will forward the packets. Right? This is essentially all of our telco infrastructure is doing. Internet world is doing with one set of protocols, one set of code. The telephony world was doing a little bit different set of code. And kind of the 5G or 4G thrust is that can same infrastructure increasingly do both. 5G introduced the uh, TCP IP network or uh, data network into the world of telecommunication protocols. And 5G is saying, no, let's make everything at the basic, the TCP IP protocols. Okay. Now, what, when we researchers are looking at everything with long term, so why we are looking at, it started with what we call active networking. So why active networking? HDM is a subset of active networking concept. Today I'll share with you the bigger concept when the HDM is coming. So what is the active networking? So the packet is to come to the switches. The traditional switch we have uh, uh, designed, traditional internet we have designed from 67 when the dark net came in. Packet, there's a data part and header part. Header part has some numbers of special information. So routers can forward them to the right direction, right? So now, David Tenehau of MIT, he will propose a radically new view. So what he's saying, that these packets are rather extremely passive. They have a header, but in that header, there is just two data elements. Nothing too much. In fact, there is no brain in that head. He envisioned an alternate form of networking, which is quite radical, that the headers now will have their own code instead of just a few labels. So you don't need code here that much. Every packet will come with their own code, how they want to get processed. And this switch will turn into some sort of computer. And every packet will have an option that how they want to get processed. Now, somebody will be using TCP IP networking headers. That's fine, they will come with the TCP IP code and so on. Somebody would like to do sonnet, they will do the sonnet, right? Everything can coexist on the same infrastructure. Okay? So this is what we envision as uh, active network. So this is a theoretical model, yeah, of course, far from anything we can realize today. Okay? An extremely powerful theoretical model. Eventually, he organized a, the US government put the uh, Department of Defense came back again to fund it. So about 50, 20 researchers looked into various aspects of it. So I happen to be one of those uh, the, the group out of those 15. So we received funding for looking into it. So that's why I share some of the things like what you can do beyond what you're hearing today and what, in fact, the, if they put in the context what SDN can achieve for you. So the idea is that completely separate the bare metal of the network from the software or the intelligence. So bare metal is optical fiber and some sort of basic routing capability. Exactly how the routing will be done, forwarding will be done, leave it up to the software. So what you can do then, <coughs> then you can create grab a subset of the bare metal infrastructure and build a very highly customized network which is highly efficient for some particular application case or particular thing you're trying to achieve. So if you have the worldwide access to this bare metal the infrastructure, so one organization can come in and say that I will pick a subset of the world infrastructure and will build and push this intelligence from somewhere else. So this will be my very interesting network for video communication, highly efficient or some. So what does I, I mean by that? Like why I picked the word video communication? So if we want to broadcast this today's video session interactively to one million users, many of you are using Skype or video chat, right? The WeChat, right? 
So how many frames do you have talked simultaneously at a time? Anybody has talked to 10 frames at a time? Some of you might be right. Mostly 2-3 frames. And many of you may not have ever tried 10 frames. So we are living into the gigabit world, right? Just 10 frames or 100 frames we cannot talk simultaneously. Why this technology is so difficult? In fact, all the gigabits are there. The reason is, the kind of protocols we are using here does not allow you to do that right. So today, underlying TCP IP network is all one path, one destination. You can emulate multicast. One is going to everywhere, right? You can emulate broadcast, but that's internally different packets are going. So in many common links, there are multiple packets are going. That's not a physical limitation. That's just a limitation the current state of TCP IP protocol reality. And you can have alternate reality. If you change the software, one optical link, the whole places where you light up in the video thing, and everybody can copy their part immediately. So in one shot, you can get 100 or even 1,000 people uh, getting the video today. That way, satellite does, right? But you cannot do that in the internet. So now, so this is one application, I'll talk about more applications. So really the idea is that you have to isolate the intelligence what we are doing, that from the bare bone metal. So now, we are seeing that uh, Malaysia is rolling out all 4G technology as we speak, right? 3G in some cases. Okay, and now my goodness, we have to do 5G. In fact, we research it, these researchers will realize all this society have to coexist with multiple protocols, multiple realities, right? Not only the services, the, all the companies they have to run. So now you get another 5G equipment for the whole thing? No. If you have this model, 5G, 4G, 2G, and the future things which are coming can coexist. Okay. Then you can have different kind of, like somebody else wants to build a different kind of network, right? So they can actually be their part of the network using some of the shared infrastructure. Okay. So this is we call the active networking or the current version what you are saying, software defined network. With that weak introduction, many problems, we solve one problem and of course we create 10 other problems, right? So there are serious problems like how to make it uh, secure, right? So people, that there are models, researchers that look into can you do current uh, the internet exchanges we have built in, right? Similar exchanges where highly secure from where you actually pump in. Uh, that nobody can just upload things there, right? In the infrastructure. So you have some kind of common body. So maybe in future, you will see MCMC is uh, launching one of those, or two of those, okay? So to handle Malaysia's uh, the infrastructure. Okay? This will be provided by one company, right? This will be given by another company meet these uh, the, gen the control centers okay. okay now they are in a different implementation stage uh, about six seven years we have seen the fast version came out the general programmability is very powerful but this is also very disruptive you cannot do that all the parts we have not solved the problems okay so the first flavor came out this has already been implemented all the Cisco equipments you get this right on the major Juniper equipment with an open flow. So what that allows a limited version of program. You do not completely change everything. Most TCP stays, but the routing table accommodates some kind of program execution on the packets. You may want to do deep packet inspection, you may want to do filter inspection, filtering, right? So what that allows you to inject some packet you can do additional processing. User defined processing. So how do you do that? The classical routing table. So one part, destination address, and the part which port to forward to, right? All today's telecom which are essentially exhibiting something like this. So what the first version of programming did, that instead of packets scanning the code, you sort of preload the code into the switch somewhere. The packet, when it comes, you match the lines. This is the classical routing table. The new routing table will have this entry, new kind of entries. Instead of the classical ones, you'll have some entries where if it matches, 
the forwarding to port 5 or port 3, you execute some code. So that is some kind of pseudo flavor of programmability. And this has found many applications in today's implementation world. Okay. You can do uh, the uh, on the fly uh, bandwidth uh, compression of packets, okay. correction of errors. Okay. And this has been implemented in most of the switches. So there are other models. <coughs> the radio community, so they have all the base stations in remote places, right? Too many base stations in remote places. So management is very difficult. So they have used something, let's take the management functionality of the thing into somewhere remote place. It's called uh, uh, cloud-based uh, rank radio access network. So you take the control, not with the operating system, you can language and use from some remotely, you decide how the uh, equipment will be provisioned. Now, <coughs> there's a question that can you do this thing in high speed? Right, we can do it in the lab, we have done it, but now we are seeing the speed is also going very fast, rapidly. Right? The 40 gig connections and uh, the, the soon Malaysia in some places they'll open up the first 100 gig connections. Most likely uh, before the end of the year, your privacy will open in the first the 100 gig connection. So now, when you are doing the extra processing, can you support it in very high speed? In fact, that problem has also been nearly tackled. Okay, so here a new kind of hardware coming up. This is an internal uh, uh, the family of hardware. So they are what they are using. The switch architecture is changing rapidly. Okay, so this is a kind of one uh, adapter uh, design architecture. The packets are coming from one end, and eventually they are going out from output ports. Right. So when the packets are coming in. So they need to be executed by custom code, right? All the packets will face custom code. So here is massively parallel array of CPUs. Okay. And right now this exists, which has approximately uh, how many, okay, 60 processes, parallel processors, and they need to packet the process. Anytime a packet comes in, one processor is assigned to the, to the packet. And fortunately, they have shown it can be massively parallel. Packets are more or less independent. So the moment packet comes in, one processor gets into action. And each processor has multiple cores. So, and they can support again multiple thread. So essentially, you can use 400 to 500 processors, the packets simultaneously. So that already achieves 40 uh, uh, the gigabit, uh, gigabit network speed. Okay. So then they have special purpose uh, uh, processors also. You want to do supporting also with cryptography, right? Extreme uh, encoding and coding. So there are chips inside it which are focusing on this, right? So this is the first generation of this uh, uh, active network kind of modules you are seeing. So Professor, this yeah. at the moment is about 40 gig. 40 gigs, yes, they are claiming 40 gigs. Yes, yeah. So but this is interesting. Even I will show some, in, even in our lab, this is one thing this is doing in the, uh, the telcos very high performance lab, right? Now we are actually looking into achieving this in our regular university labs. Okay, so the speed width that you need a very special purpose thing, very expensive thing to achieve the speed, we are questioning that. I don't think so, that's very serious thing. Okay, in the lab we can achieve these things, okay? So, uh, Essentially what we're going now, the cost issue. We all have to reduce the cost. The more you can use general purpose machines, you save on the cost. So let's come into the cost issue, right? How it helps. So today, if you uh, are setting up a telecom infrastructure, the company will let you buy many, many things. Okay, these appliances, routers, CDN, Water control router, you have to be there buy another piece. Okay. A deep packet inspection, you have to buy another very expensive piece. This can go million dollar, just one piece of uh, deep packet inspectors. Okay. Firewalls. Okay. So this is the scenario you have. So all companies to come up with the, 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 the if a, a, a new telephone company wants to build something network, 
they will ship all of these products separately. Each one is expensive. And what is worse, when the new technology is coming in, you cannot reuse these machines for that. You have to buy another set. Then you are thinking what to do with my previous investment. Okay. So you are walking to a huge dilemma. Should I buy more of this? Two of these needed, I buy from the same company, then further locked in. It's an immediate cost. Okay. So this is in every telecommunication, the business room, this is the essentially decision they are taking. Right? So you are locked in the costly physical install or appliance per site. Then one company's thing will not work with another company's thing, hardware development, long cycle, even for the companies, the long cycle to develop a new hardware. New vendors, you can wish them good luck in this situation. Okay. Uh, essentially, this is becoming the story of last 15, 20 years. Increasingly, right? The quickly. So, what? Finally, that active network group, we are actually saying, you have an alternate pathway. And increasingly convincing the vendors, listen to us, it will be good for you, us, everyone. So what we are saying, let's put an alternate reality. reality. Okay, that's our current reality, but there is a better future, better reality. So what we do is of having all this thing. Think about some standard high volume Ethernet switch. Very standard generic Ethernet switch. Now high volume. I'll show that from one piece you can build all of them. So if you say only one million of those, another 500 of this, another 250 of these, you will be selling 2 million of those, one piece. But then, add to that some standard high volume servers, standard high volume storage. And then, let the innovators, even the companies themselves, in fact, their real, when the companies are selling it, their real value item is the piece of the algorithm they have, right, software they have. They themselves can package their software here, so it will run on these generic platforms. And then new players also come in. And you have an orchestration, orchestration layer actually to see which equipment you go when. And just putting these virtual appliances, you can turn this thing to this, this thing into that, that wherever you need what. Now, yes, we need to think about the capacity and those things, right? So if you want to increase capacity of these, you can increase some of these might be, right? But that is not, your investment is not locked into only message routers. Later on, you can convert the same thing into something else where it to grow. You can much more balance your investment. So, now you say what kind of communication is possible here, right? I'll show you some of the kind of like the very difficult to achieve communication thing we have achieved in our land. So, one thing of that is uh, the delay guaranteed complication. You cannot do that very well in a TCP IP network. There is no guarantee of anything. Right? So, in a TCP IP network, uh, if you look into the control machines and everything, they need some sort of delay guarantee. If, if the delay is not very low, still there is delay guarantee. So, once we can have handle inside the routers, queues, and sites, so we can do the complex math and let the application adjust with the network condition situation much more instantaneous. Okay, the common sense, the things that there is a congestion and anything in the networks of failure, let the application know about it. You cannot do that in current network, but when you have the activeness, you can actually have those. So there are a couple of PhD dissertation on it. So this spent years on it. I'm not going to their mathematics and everything. In total, what we can achieve, so if the congestion is uh, moving like that, right, the whole video uh, uh, generation can adjust to that. So by this adjustment, even if you have a very low core network, you will get very good temporal quality. That means video frames will come in sequence. Rather, somewhere, the, the visual quality will go down. But this is important because for interactive video or perceptual data, time is very important. If it little bit blurs, it is not that disturbing to you. But if the things don't come in time, immediately you feel that's how the biological system is. 
different so video perception, right? So we can actually this is a perceptually adaptive uh, the video we can uh, we have use. Then another issue is fast handoff. So in telephone cell phone tower, when if something moves from one station to another station, right, they do the handoff. Unfortunately, for TCP/IP work, it's not easy to achieve. Okay, there is no handoff really, right? So they have hidden it for a while. That when you move into the TCP TCP/IP world, handoff is extremely uh, emulated. Really, separate software component runs to emulate a handoff. Now the handoff. So what we have done using the interactivity or responsiveness from network units, we have in the lab designed very fast handoffs. So how fast? Uh, this is me, mobile IP. Okay, this is the mobile uh, 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 TCP IP version of handoff mechanism. Okay. So typically, if you move from one uh, access station, right now, in my cell phone might be here, right? So if I move it to the next uh, cell phone uh, access station, then you will see the notice the handoff problem. Your connection may get disrupted for two, three seconds or more, maybe ten seconds. Okay, now 10 seconds is not acceptable in voice communication. By that time, you have said 10 things, and your other side didn't say your whole conversation is disrupted, right? So, we could actually, this is a millisecond figure. So, we put the real handoff things in various places of uh, Virginia, Texas, around the USA, the real system which is handling that handoff, where the MIP took 14 seconds, 14,000 milliseconds. 14 seconds or 42 seconds, something 43 seconds, we can bring down the uh, hand of time to 110 seconds or something, which is kind of in the range of visual, uh, the, 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 the perceptual quality that you can bear. But of course, this is just in very simple labs. Take it to a little bit more sophisticated implementation, you most likely can do the further. So then, Let's look into another model what we are working on. So, uh, what is the conventional wisdom? That a file is large and a lot of people are trying to access it, we are going to create a log jam, right? The website will be congested, the where you are trying to download, right? One file. So that's the kind of thing we experienced for years. That's the common the, the, uh, the crash of Olympic website, right? Uh, one of the Olympic. The too many people are trying to log in and it cannot supply anymore the file, right? So now this is a very bad problem because not only the site, the network around it also gets congested, right? So it cannot, there's no easy solution to it. But we thought that is the something we can incorporate, that you cannot change it. But suddenly, something came up like BitTorrent. Have you heard about BitTorrent? What they have done, something very interesting, they completely reversed this hard law. So they are saying the more a file is popular, the more people want to download, the larger is the file, it will download faster. The more people want to download a file, it will download faster. And they demonstrate okay, so how it can be done. So what we are doing in our lab, so essentially what they do, uh, they create a swarm, the fish swarm, right? And everybody contributes in this exchange, not only the central side. When the central side set gives everything, you get this uh, traffic jam. But when you have a large file, you share them into pieces, break them into pieces. And the main site, when the first person comes in, I want this, he gives them one piece. The main side, then the, this, uh, uh, which is called Richard, who wants to take it, he wants to take a file, well, I'll give you the second file, but now you start giving the first file to everyone else. Okay. So the main side does not give all the files to any one person. So everybody wants to download, he gives them one piece. And then he gradually moves, goes away from the site. And the rest of them start exchanging the pieces. And this is the more side joins in, you will get faster eventually the download completion. Right? So 
So we have enumerated that for file exchanges uh, a little bit more in our lab. And in particular, what we're looking at, the how you can use this thing to distribute the video sessions very fast. Now, video sessions are a little bit constrained. You have to maintain some sequence of the file. People have to do see files in sequence, not in out of sequence. But that's the thing PhD students or master students all in the lab. But I just gave you the idea what kind of radical things you can do if you are not stuck to this network. Okay. All you need to get to implement that is a slice, video distribution slice, put the, uh, the swarm uh, protocols there, and then they will set up the exchange policies and you get the file download very fast. And of course, everybody doesn't want to do video communication, right? There are banks who are very much secure about, uh, the worried about security, right? So everything has been encrypted, doubly encrypted, triple encrypted, everywhere, every line. There are even more security conscious applications like Wikileaks, okay? So even the government want to poke, that they want to make something, even government cannot break it, right? So now they need to do a little bit more uh, interesting things there. So everything, you can actually uh, infuse into networks and you create your own wonderful own network infrastructure. So that's kind of the software defined network. So we are right now, last week, one of my students actually defended on this chart. Okay. So this is what we're trying to achieve. Zero delay communication. Okay. You talk about one of the goal of the 5G is very low latency, right? So this is part of our research. So what we are doing, so <laughs> this is uh, NCTCP, somewhere in there, Inigo, XCP, okay. So this NCTCP and XCP we are competing with today. Now Inigo is the protocol right now used for uh, something similar to that used by Google Hangout. How many of you have, have Google Hangout account? Most likely you have. That, that's a video chat mechanism for uh, the video social network for Google chat, right? So this is essentially the performance of Google. Okay. So what? Of course, it's not fair comparison because they are not using the. Uh, uh, you can change the protocol things in the network too effectively, right? But assuming that if you have a little bit of handle of infusing your own uh, reporting mechanism from the switch, so all the switch, they don't have to do anything special. All they have to do is notify the giving sites to the video center. Then you can actually bring your delay to somewhere here, 0 0.05 milliseconds. Giving delay. Of course, the propagation delay is there. You cannot do too much anything. That's the speed of light, right? But after propagation delay, propagation delay is gone, and after propagation delay, that's where the human intelligence comes in, right? So we can bring it down to this level. Okay. So that's I think on the advertisements. So if you go to this kind of infrastructure, the, the, the technology, it is coming, that the major reduction in campus equipment cost. Okay. Same equipment if you get the basic server, they can be reused for all kinds of specialty devices. And then <coughs> one company who are building those infrastructure, they can rent it out to third innovating companies. Like somebody from me in the lab, we are trying to create a very good video distribution network for the university, right? Another for the bank. So they can rent that hardware and build their own infrastructure. Of course, you can get carrier grade resilience at low cost. Maintenance, everything becomes simple. Okay, uh, you no longer need application specific hardware. You don't every hardware somebody has to be trained in the company to maintain it, right? It becomes, even for company, it becomes easier. The network operators, they are trying to roll out here, let's say IoT, right? Wow, they have, they are looking for, oh my goodness, wait for one million customer to show up. So since they are not getting one million customer, those who are, uh, those have hundred dollar customer, they kind of come in and start the journey towards one million. So you have a kind of chicken and egg problem there, right? Once you have this shared infrastructure, right then and then on the current infrastructure, if they have that kind of provisionable infrastructure, there's a small customer coming on to try IoT. They can launch the IoT without huge investment. Okay. So this means those network operators who are trying to innovate, things becomes uh, smart. You can do green IoT. Everything is running in the common uh, the set of servers, right? So 
if there is a workload is less, you shut down some of the server and move your workload on the limited amount of servers, right? So you can do uh, take all those benefits. So it opens up a whole ecosystem of virtual appliances. So these things is the limitless. All the universities then can come in with, right? We have seen some very nice labs around the, the, the Malaysia, right? All of them are saying, I cannot get into the Tipco's uh, market. Okay, that's the thing we are working on 5G, DT, DT, IoT, but at the end, I have did it. Because all of them are buying from this big supplier company, the closed box. Yeah. But if you move into the generic architecture, then, yes. Dr. Tariq's lab can bring a students from there actually can think something about just for Malaysia or for the world. And you can actually have a place in this world innovation stage. So, the, uh, what the message here is think virtualization is coming. This is already real as I speak. The software finally the vendors are putting those things there. Okay, and encourage your vendors to virtualize. We are talking about the National Communication Infrastructure, NCI, right? So, if you virtualize, you're going to increase their affordability and agility for all the interesting things which are coming and being built up in the lab. Okay, so should I stop or continue? Continue. Uh, how, how much more? <laughs> how much more? Uh, these are lighter, even lighter. Uh, okay, very fast. So the the like when I mean the virtualization, right? So it may look very new, but in fact this has already happened. Okay, so let me talk about that. We talked about the data centers, right? So <coughs> we know that this is a standard typical traffic growth, right? Internet network traffic growth. All the telco will provide you, we have that from where we made data. Okay. Right now, these are at the level of one uh, zettabyte. 10 to the power 12, something like that. Yeah. So one zettabyte, this is 0.9 zettabyte actually. Something. So, uh, <coughs> oh sorry, exabyte, exabyte. Okay, I myself is confused. Okay, so exabyte per month, so approximately, uh, 96 exabytes, uh, that's where we are. So it's very close to a gigabyte, one gigabyte. Okay. So they're going to grow up like that, this is Cisco's prediction. But do you know what is in the traffic? So let me tell you what is in the traffic. <coughs> this blue part is called CDN traffic, content data networking traffic. All the YouTubes they are downloading, right? They are coming from a local server. So the, the Google, they have been actually already pushed their data centers or content distribution network Akamai into various tables. So those now represent approximately half of the data. And rest is user to the data. So now this is going to further increase. And this is increasing. So what happening? So this data when uh, somebody has YouTube or some bank has uh, their data, data, right? Everybody is accessing. So what CDN does, it wants to, uh, uh, the bank doesn't want to uh, solve it from its core infrastructure. It normally has the, has the bandwidth. They give it to the network. So the network people, then takes it closer to the users. They know where most of the users come from. So there is a hard drive and they put the thing there. So then when the user accesses, they no longer access from banks' own data center. It accesses from the content distribution network provider's data center. So this is the first thing which happened, that those who own the data, including banks, they normally would like to solve it from right from the data center, right? But they gain increased trust into the CDNs, that I can give the data to CDN to distribute, because at the end, this means better service to my customers. Right? So now this model, for virtualization is expanding to something additional. So what is coming in, the data need to be computed, right? You need to do some computation. Banks need to do some computation on the data. So now banks are increasingly not only taking the hard drive from the CDN. They're saying, okay, I will use your computer also. 
because that's where the anyway the data have to be distributed for. So let's do the computation there also. So the computation is also now coming into the network, not only the data. And companies are increasingly trusting the network to do that. So what does it mean? So you take a little bit of network, computer storage, and offer it as a computing service to the companies. So the networking companies are now getting engaged in creating some virtual servers, these things. And companies and creating, instead of having a supercomputer, mini supercomputer in their own uh, data center, they are renting it from the companies, uh, for the telecom company. How does it help them? The CapEx investment. Not only maintain a supercomputing center or maintain a big data center, it's hugely expensive. So let's give it to <coughs> the service provider in the network who provide these services, and they charge me monthly. So my CapEx investment is low. That's very important when the technology is rapidly changing. So they are going increasingly to the network providers who provide infrastructure as a service, not only the data storage. So processor, storage, network, this comes from the cloud provider. And the consumer can install the operating system uh, applications there. So this is called infrastructure as service. Now this started five, six years back. So now companies are increasingly reliant. If I run my own operating system, that becomes also expensive. I have to have my own engineers, compatibility issues, operating system, version up is coming in. So they are saying, hey, network company, you also give me the operating system, everything, finished service. I give you monthly this thing. You process the data. Okay. So this is called platform as a service. There's another advanced version. Even the very expensive softwares, which companies need to run their uh, with the accounting system and so on. Let the communication company uh, provide that. So here, this is the ultimate form, right? Ultimately, the company is trusting network to do everything. Okay. And then the data is being distributed from there also, right? So now this is three models of cloud. So <coughs> this is the current scenario. How do you do that? Effectively, cost is an issue. So they use the same virtualization thing. So what they call <coughs> hypervisor is the thing. So they have <coughs> the computers which has a special type of very core operating system. This one can create, one hardware can create Microsoft Word, oh sorry, Microsoft <coughs> Windows or Apple or something else, right? So a user <coughs> whose whole application runs on Apple. So he can get his Apple hardware out of the same hardware. Somebody else, Windows, they are running. So he can get his server from Windows emulated here, right? So these infrastructure company, the networking company, are providing this cloud service. They are buying tons of these hypervisor and inviting all the businesses come and actually use our machine. Okay, and this is rapidly growing. There are other models that not go there. So if you look into the uh, <coughs> models of uh, this taking the cloud computation or network computation, this is the one, the highest form, the software as a service. Everything I give in the hand of they will, the, the communication service providers, right? I trust my everything, life and everything, software everything. And this is, I just take the hardware and then I run my own software and everything, right? So see, this is 2015, 16, 17 is the proportion. How much the business has moved there, computation is also into the network. <coughs> so, uh, so, what's happening? The computation and data is moving inside the network. Right, which used to be separate with the, uh, the age, age is there, right? Now that is uh, that is also an interesting uh, the implication. Those who are providing the central services, the clouds, now to scale up, they no longer can do the same thing to the core of the network, but they are creating a distributed cloud infrastructure internal. So now the network is bifurcating. In outside world, you have the usual internet yourself. But the inside is expanding with very high performance, this kind of the data center computation units. And what is more interesting, the kind of protocol they're running inside, those are no longer the TCP Those cannot scale up. Massive amount of data transfer. Since they own the infrastructure, 
to very easily switch out, move out those old protocols, put their own protocols. They are actually running different their protocols. What I talked about in the virtualization of the ACH discussion. So <coughs> uh, now you have kind of different way of measuring traffic. Data center to user, data center to data center, within data center, right? So, and when we are seeing the data center to data center traffic, this is using already different kind of uh, protocols. Okay, so now what's happening on the network infrastructure world? So redesigning is going on in national, uh, the way you design your national infrastructure. So what does that mean? So this is a picture of a network access point. So all telcos have to maintain a network access point, right? National access point to connect to international networks, right? Uh, they have to maintain POP to get their customers there, right? So this is a new national access point. So what is it? This is, in Miami, 752,000 square feet facility. All running those special purpose servers and everything. Those generic servers which will do everything, the virtualization, right? Now why? This is the place, this has been particularly designed for entire Latin America. All the ISPs of the, uh, the telecom providers, their network is converging in this building. Okay. And all the providers, their computing infrastructure, they can rent it from here. Everybody knows they need a computing infrastructure, right? Those kind of the new virtualization. Where they have to put it? Okay. Those have to be placed in strategically right place into the network infrastructure, global network infrastructure. So where you have the world network of optical fibers running and everything, these are the prime assets there in the virtual the telecommunication world, right? So there, so governments are, or organizations are putting in these kind of facilities. Now, how important is strategically? This is about the future, right? So this, what you are seeing, this is this building is bomb proof, cyclone proof, <coughs> flood proof, and this actually they have a satellite connection to their disaster recovery site. In case there are major disasters, even after those, okay, they have live satellite every time connecting. Any time they can actually ship their services. Right? Now these things are popping up around the world. This is not the only one. Okay. So this is the Google's one, a little bit older one. Okay. The Google also did a very similar thing. Uh, this is one uh, in Newport, England. Okay. So these are called hyper data centers. Now what it means roughly this definition to qualify as a hyper data you have to have a two billion dollar business case, something like that. Okay. Above. So those hyper data centers are popping up in strategic positions of the global internet network. Okay. Now, kind of uh, is that, uh, okay, this is another one, Microsoft one. Okay. So they were one of the leaders actually realizing this. But these are also, all of the data centers have to be planned with extreme expandability. That's the kind of expandability they are actually looking at. So they have designed on containers, no longer building in that sense, right? So they can actually readily keep on adding containers. This one right now has the largest capacity uh, in terms of the storage. Okay, <coughs> so these hyper data centers, right now 45% of those are in USA, but other countries are joining in. Okay, USA means that the US company owns them, right? Or US organization. China has entered, your neighbor, <coughs> Singapore has one, right? So this is the future of uh, later. So, uh, so what's kind of the message that when you'll be designing the national communication infrastructure, all of your clients, right, the, all the monitor, right, all the, uh, uh, Telco, right? They have the national assets. Gradually, have to be mindful that they are keeping this data view, that increasing the computation and everything is coming to the core of the network. That view as the design model of the network. Okay. So now, uh, jump into another thing. All of you have talked about the internet and these things, right? So a little bit of negative message I give. Okay. So they are slow down. Okay. So the uh, smartphone smart grids, everything is there, smart city, everything is coming, right? One of the questions that the government should be prepared, right? So let's look into, I'm not sure too much of the smart grid and internet things, 
Okay, let me show you something. Okay, so this is a fitness tracker, right? These are coming everywhere, right? A fitness tracker. So many companies have made fitness. Are anybody using here with your watch or something, right? How much you have run and so on, right? Yes. And this is the bad news for you. Okay. So all fitness tra trackers have been found to be leaking information. They are leaking left and right. Okay. So all information one is encouraging. These are in the wireless here. It's a snooper. Anybody can reach it. Okay. So uh, citizens land in Toronto, they exactly selling fitness trackers. Almost all of them leaks data. Okay. So now, of course, at the moment there are no bad cases, but there are possibility. Let's say somebody has the asthma. Okay. And they say, oh, by the way, we have a very serious situation right now. Okay, your heart beat and everything is So he runs and takes inhaler. Actually, nothing is wrong with him. <laughs> so that's just a fitness tracker, right? Okay, so this is basement. Okay, the cardiac devices. Okay. So one company invested a lot in this, right? They devised this thing. Okay. Nearly billion has been spent to develop that. September 1, 2017, two and a half weeks back. Half a million of those, all recorded. Why? Virus. Hackers. <laughs> okay. So look at the company who made this investment. Right? What happens to those investments? So it's one thing to have a virus in my laptop. Is another thing to have a virus in my heart. <laughs> okay, so now another uh, interesting thing. How many of you wearing a smartwatch? Okay, some of you most likely smart enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. But maybe if you are not wearing a smartwatch, you might be smarter. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, I'll show the, just in our department, we are uh, going through the hiring phase. So one of the young uh, professors with uh, the uh, candidate, right? So he showed, and uh, he, 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 he didn't actually didn't take it back. There are many other researchers who have done this, right? One group has done it. You have, there's a gyroscope here, GPS and those things here, right? So if you, you first of all, you can hack that. And number two, if you have that data, when I'm typing in anything, the password, just by the gyroscope movement tracking, you can figure out what I have typed. You hide your password, right? You're in the cell phone machine, ATM machine, right? Then the cover, okay, you're putting your pin there, right? <laughs> Nobody can see, okay? But actually, the watcher is right in your hand. Okay, so they are actually tracking your with the gyroscope movements, okay, acceleration and so on, and they can figure out what you have typed in. With 80% to 90% accuracy in the first attempt. <laughs> okay, so now see something else. So this is the live, uh, the animation of a DDoS attack going on. Everybody is attacking one side, right? And this one happened in, uh, started in around August 2016. First it was found. And they took control of all the smart DVD players and smart coffee machines. Okay. So they played the default password uh, with the attack. Okay. The devices hardly anybody changes the default password, right? So they show the, the, the hackers took over all those things. Okay, you can actually do a web search on it, right? And they launch so far the largest DDoS attack, they reach terabyte in the way they attacked. Okay, that's not easy to achieve. Okay, so all they have to do is take over all the smart DVD players and coffee machine. And now the problem is. But you can reset the password once it's infected. If you switch it on, it will go away, right? The moment you switch it off, uh, switch it on again, again it will reload the whole thing back. Okay, once your password is in crack, install something there, and this is very difficult to get rid of. Okay, so now let's move to another uh, simulation. You can see very short glimpse of it. What did you see here? So what I'm showing here is a video taken from a drone. Okay. So you see, see, can you see a building here? Kind of the building lighted at night, right? 
Okay, so this DNA has Philips smart bulbs. So ha ha hackers, they sent drone. <coughs> Completely make it crazy. And from that drone, they took the picture and put it in the internet. Okay, so this is your another smart IoT device, right? Okay, smart thermostat, right? You see, I will not let you uh, uh, increase or decrease the temperature if you don't pay me one Bitcoin. <laughs> this is another real one, LG TV. Okay, so some hacker put it infected with the thing, so you get a legal notice. Nice, that okay, that uh, uh, your thing has been taken over, and you have to pay a certain amount. And they do did some business analysis. So they charge something like you have to pay five hundred dollars or something to get this thing removed. Mm -hmm. So they went to LG to repair it, right? And LG was charging six hundred dollars too. <laughs> <laughs> so when the person will go, right? So uh, what is the message? Okay, there are many many things. Okay, the very interesting thing that this is many of the things. The almost all IoT devices which is in the market are leaking. Okay, so that is the exuberance about, you will hear a lot of things exuberance, right? IoT is coming, this is coming, right? So, this is the status. Okay. You may say, oh my goodness, what I'm saying, right? Completely different thing, whatever heart. Okay. And most uh, problematic thing is that the main, one of the main vulnerabilities in the communication protocols. That we have heard the, the, the news, so we looked into some of the protocols one by one, right? We looked into it to that. Essentially, this is not an easy thing. Okay. So there are whole uh, attack issues one to resolve. So just in the variables, right? How many parties are involved? You may have a very secure communication, but your uh, cell phone, you are uploading unsecure apps. Wrong, right? Then your attacker will use very secure communication so you cannot break it. Okay. So Bluetooth, uh, USB operating system, operating system provider, the, the apps you are looking, the app framework from here, you actually downloading your app, everything is in potential point of attack. So these have to be sorted. So what is the role here? So what is happening actually? Data network is not information network. We have built a wonderful network over the last 30 years with a very good advanced sophisticated millions of uh, the gigabit capacity, right? The very fast everything, but that's data network. We have taken very little understanding what is information network. Information is money, right? Stock exchange that made information is money. But now we are entering the group. information is going to be lethal. It will kill. So, we take a completely relaxed approach in data network work, what, what to, how to design it, something like that. But, this is going to be lethal and much more state, human will be harmed and they will, public will come back to you. What the regulatory bodies are doing there, okay? What the government is doing there, right? I saw a beautiful video uh, there, the, that the, the cell phone is exploding, right? The MCMC is looking into the in the safety of the device, right? So now, unfortunately, you have a very big problem and where the user bodies have to increasingly look into how to make this secure for public. Once there are in the serious cases, the public pressure will grow to have better look into the thing. So it's always better that industry themselves comes with actually start looking into the issue. So with that, I will end my very long talk. Get ready for making your national communication infrastructure ready for information age. So hope I have not bored you uh, a lot. Okay. So feel free to ask questions. Okay. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for your time. Very good. Uh, in fact, that's a way of creating shared services, like infrastructure sharing, right? The 
uh, that can be uh, like the, 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 that can be achieved cost effectively if you have the virtualization framework installed. Right? Uh, that it can be done without uh, virtualization, but if you have the, your infrastructure ready with virtualization technology, then shared services can be offered from the same infrastructure at various levels. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, right now you're tower sharing, right? If you have the, in the radio equipment are ready to do the uh, these virtualization. So then, same radio equipment, when the manufacturer uh, manufactures it, can support all the spectrum. The company A has two spectrums, company B has another two spectrum. With the virtualization, they can actually share immediately the same equipment to operate all four spectrums. Right now, company A buys their radio equipment for AB spectrum, and company B again goes and buys another radio equipment for their spectrum, right? And they put two equipment into the tower. So your tower is heavier. Okay, and they quarrel about, uh, I got the upper position, I didn't get the upper position, right? I came late, so now the same equipment, then both company can operate and offer the two different services. Or one company can offer two different services. So these are the advantage. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes. So you say virtualization, software defined networks can all depend on software. And software you can actually check them easily. Yes. So, so it's opening up a lot of Exactly. So this really opens up uh, uh, another can of worm. Okay. Uh, so the the question is more of a like you have to address it from the cost point of view. That uh, when you open up uh, more uh, uh, the, the the vulnerability of the infrastructure, right? So there have to be more uh, physical protection have to intertwine with uh, the uh, software protection, right? So that has to be done anyway. So the software, uh, the more it is powerful to manage it easier, the more it is powerful to harm you as well. So you have to take it from that point of view. And that's a serious concern. And software management of security is a very difficult because you know you keep on having to install new patches and update. It may cost a lot. Yes. So the, uh, right now, so the, when we include uh, the legal world, the, the lawyer side, mm -hmm. they view that you really cannot completely stop it. No. So rather the way society we deal it, we have the traceability, right? So the whole, uh, the, the bottom of design has to be in who you should be able to trace who has done something wrong and identify the parties more distinctly. Mm -hmm. How many parties are there? That's an EU initiative. Okay, and let everybody decide who they are, and then you impose certain kind of rules and regulations. Like the real world, if a, a medical device comes in, it's a vulnerable. But actually, you know whom to blame because the manufacturer at the end have to take the responsibility, right? So that sorts out. That puts manufacturer in the position that I really have to do what is humanly possible best way to secure it. Although this is not hundred percent secure, right? So first step is to identify the parties and then give them a legal as well as technical framework so that they can increase the security of their part of the world. Yeah. But we do not do that in the way uh, we currently handle computer science or engineering. So any questions? So thank you so much. If not, uh, it's a small cup of Thank you very much.